Lord, we just come before you and we thank you so much that we are able to worship freely, that our hearts are not chained by cares and concerns, but are set free by you. And so as we seek your word tonight, just be with us, Father, lead the charge, set the shield wall, change the atmosphere, Father. And all glory and honor is yours and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen. So this, uh, I've had this sermon just kind of brewing for a while, and it's, I call it one person. And so, it was kind of interesting. I was, I was excited for it when he gave me the, the one person, the, the title. And so I started seeking it and, and going through and, and researching this and that. And, you know, I was talking it up to everybody. And then when it came time to really just start formulating, and, and as I had written all my notes for this, I was just like, what? this doesn't feel cohesive. It doesn't feel like a, a sermon. It felt like pieces and parts that were just being mashed together. And so, so I struggled with it for a bit. You know? But so when, when I heard the one person, I kind of go, okay, I, my mind went to all the biblical fi figures in the Bible, you know, and just started going, okay, well, which one am I going to pick? You know, which ones am I going to pick? And, you know, the truth is, is when you look at, you know, when you think about the Bible and you think about the, the um, you, you know, the figures that are in there, there's just so many that are larger than life. You know, you have David, you have Elijah, you have, you know, Saul, you have, you, you know, you have Jesus, like all these one person that you can choose, you, you know, Paul, <laughs> any of the 12 disciples, all of these people, you know, you could go, you know, Samuel, you could go, you know, Ruth, you could go Esther, like all these things. And they're just larger than life. And, you know, and in all honesty, for me, for years, it would be, I would almost, like, set them up on a pedestal, like, almost as unattainable as I would Jesus. You know, like, Jesus is here, and then I would put them up, you know, just below Jesus. And, and, and that's not where they need to be. You know, because then if you take a step back and you look at their lives and you look at how often David screwed up and, and, and other people screwed up and their life situations came, like, I don't know, it was just, it, they, it, they become realer. But I mean, you have, you know, if you look at second, you don't have to turn there, but Second Samuel 28, or 23, 8 through 39, list these David's mighty men, you know, so if, even if you're just talking about figures in the Bible, you know, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb, Beshebeth, the Tachmanite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David whom they defied the Philistines, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel retreated, he rose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. You know, and through all that, through verse 39, it's just listing one person after another, after another, after another. And they're great you know, the things that they were known for. So, you know, in Bible, biblical time, these guys would have been gigantic heroes, you know, and then, and then you, you take a step back and as you're reading it and you look at yourself, you look at yourself and you go, there's no way I could slay 800 men. You know, there's no way I could do any of the things. There's no way I could be a Ruth. I could be an Esther. You, you know, you look at yourself and you know, you just speak those things over me, I, you know, over yourself. I'm the same way. I've done that. You know, and so, so I asked the Lord, I'm like, why one person? Why one person? What can one person do? 
And so as I was looking up all these names, and I mean, I Googled, um, I Googled major Bible characters, I Googled minor Bible characters, figures. I even was like, give me obscure Bible figures. And as I'm going through them, I'm like, the, the ones that I need to do are, the, are the, the, the obscure figures. I need to take a look at some of these figures that you haven't heard of, that you know, aren't mentioned as often in the Bible. So I'm taking a look at four people. I'm taking a look at Micaiah, M-I-C-A-I-A-H. I'm looking at Oded, O-D-E-D. I'm looking at Urijah, U-R-I-J-A-H, and I'm looking at Ananias, A-N-A-N-I-A-S. And so Micaiah, you know, what's funny is that, you know, my mentor years ago, um, she had written a, kind of like a blog about it, about this, this guy, because the Lord led him to him, and it's just so funny how periodically, time and time again, I just come back to this guy and just, and I'm going to read it. He, he just, he just amazes me. He, he shocks me. And he really fits into this because most people haven't even heard of the guy. So it's 1 Kings 22. And it's 1 through 12. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to the, his servants, Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? And we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the Lord, the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to, Jeho to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire the Lord. But I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah the son of Imlah quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah the son of Chanana had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hands. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered, Go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into, your hand, into the hand of the king. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? 
Then Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, In what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him, and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now Zedekiah the son of Chanana went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. So the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Amon the governor of the city and to Joash the king's son and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Take heed, all you people. To me, this is an amazing story. An amazing, amazing story. And it's one person. Never heard of him before. And he's one person. And so what did he do? He stood before two kings. He stood before 400 prophets. And he spoke the word of the Lord. He was hit. He was mocked. He was put in prison. One man. The Lord's word and one man. And then if you go to Second Chronicles 28, 9. So here we go. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out before the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Look, because the Lord God of your fathers was angry with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that reaches up to heaven. And now you propose to force the children of Judah and Jerusalem to be your male and female slaves. But are you not also guilty before the Lord your God? Now hear me, therefore, and return the captives whom you have taken captive from your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Then some of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Zariah, the son of Jehanan, Berechiah, the son of Meshillamoth, and all these other guys, <laughs> stood up against those who came from the war and said to them, You shall not bring the captives here, for we are already we already have offended the Lord. You intend to add to our sins and to our guilt, and for our guilt is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the leaders and all the assembly. Then the men who were designated by name rose up and took the captives, and from the spoil they clothed all who were naked among them dressed them and gave them sandals, gave them food and drink and anointed them, and they let all the feeble ones ride on donkeys. So they brought them to their brethren at Jericho, the city of palm trees, then they returned to Samaria. So the Lord had sent the king of Syria and Israel to fight and basically reprimand Judah. And here is a conquering army army high off of success thinking they'd done right they had done the Lord's work and here comes Oded this is the only time he's mentioned in the Bible he rebukes the army he stands before the army before these leaders of Israel 
and rebukes them to turn around, to undo what they've done. And they heeded him. So they went from sinning and to potentially even heaping more sin on them to changing their tune. Then you go to Jeremiah 26.20. Jeremiah 26.20. Now there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of kirjath Jerem who prophesied against this city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. And when Jehoiakim, the king, with all his mighty men and all the princes, heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. Then Jehoiakim, the king, sent men to Egypt. Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and other men who went with him to Egypt. And they brought Urijah from Egypt, brought him to Jehoiakim the king, who killed him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Nevertheless, the hand of Achim, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah so that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. So that's it. He's a footnote, more or less. Urijah. And so, you know, I struggle with this guy the most because as I'm talking to the Lord and I'm asking him and seeking his, his word for this, this sermon, I'm going, why do you want me to include this dude? You know, if I'm supposed to encourage these people with one person, you know, to show them, you, you know, that one person does something, what, what, is, what am I supposed to tell them about Urijah. How am I supposed to encourage them? And and when he gave me it, it clicked. Are you willing to die? He was willing to die. Urijah was willing to die. Not only physically, But he was willing to die so that the word would be given. The warning would be given. This is the same warning that Jeremiah has given in previous chapters to Israel and Judah. And he gives the same one, but he loses his life. And so then you go to Ananias. Acts 9. And so this is probably, he's the, I would say he's the more famous of, of the four, char- of four figures that, have, that the Lord wants me to use. Acts 9, 11 through 19. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who come call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, he, and he arose and was baptized. So here we are. Ananias. Coming. Laying hand at the, at the, at the, the behest of the Lord. Coming. Laying his hands on this guy that basically came out to find people such as him and to kill him. And so I had all these, these notes, right, about these four guys. And I just kept asking the Lord, what's, what's the point of one person? What's the point of one person? And I just wasn't getting, it. nothing was clicking. And then I happened to ask him the right question. And I said, Lord, what can one person do? And I almost felt him like smile and be like, about time you asked the right question. And I said, Lord, what can one person do? And the answer I heard was everything. One person can do everything. And so you, when I heard that, I was like, you know, the heavens opened up and I heard the Lord and I saw him and, and just everything fell into place. You know, you have Micaiah and he's standing there. One person can stand against the crowd. He can rebuke and he can tell the truth. He can stand in the face of ridicule, of potential death and imprisonment. He can stand before kings and declare the truth of the Lord against 400 other voices. He is secure in, his, in, in the belief that the Lord gave him. That's what one person can do. You have Oded standing before a victorious army with bloodied weapons, blood on their hands, standing before an army and rebuking them telling them that they have sinned and now that they have, they have to fix what they have done, that they went overboard and they changed their ways. You can stand in front of a crowd. The one person can stand before armies and change their hearts and their direction. You have Urijah, and this one was like, whoa, when it clicked. And he said, Urijah was willing to die for his word. Did he run? Sure. Did he try and prolong it? Yeah, wouldn't we all? But he spoke his word, knowing that he could die. And die he did. But here's the question. What can, it, can a, what can an individual do? Can they be willing to die physically? Yes. Can they be willing to die? And are you willing to die when you are that one person socially or relationally? Are you willing to sacrifice relationships, social clout, are you so solid in your faith, in the belief that God has said what he said over you, done what he's done for you, that you are willing to say and do what needs to be done and lose it all? To have family ridicule you, to lose friends over the fact that you're seeking the Lord more. I've had that happen. I don't have very many friends and relationships now because my hunger for the Lord has pushed them away because I want to be challenged. I want to know more. I want to seek the Lord more. 
and there were some that just weren't ready or willing or wanted to walk beside me. But not only that, not only did he, is the one person willing to sacrifice everything physically, socially, relationally, but are you willing to do it so that others can follow behind you? You know, turn to second, first Samuel 15. First Samuel 15, verse 22. You guys know this. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. These men, and there are women in there too, unknowns were obedient. And because they were obedient, they received, they received the Lord's blessing. But they were obedient, not afraid, not hesitant, because they knew the Lord. They sought the Lord. They felt the Lord. You know, Matthew 9 Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. He needs the one person. The Lord needs the one person. The ones to stand before the crowd. The ones to stand before individuals. And speak his word, speak the truth, unabashedly, unashamed, not in a quiet voice, but boldly. He needs the one person. He uses the one person. But the warning is, In 1 Kings 1918. 1 Kings 1918. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all those whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The warning is be the one person. Don't succumb to the mentality of the only person. You can become self-important and think that you are the only person doing this. You are the only person who can do this. The only one that the Lord can use to accomplish His goals. And therein lies the fall and the sin. It can lead to pride. It can lead to shame. You know, in that previous passage, you know, Elijah had just got done slaughtering all the prophets of Baal. And then he got a, a death threat and he ran away. And now he's at the mountain before God, bemoaning God, saying, I am the only one who's done this. I am the only one that's standing up for you. Only one in Israel. And the Lord says, you are not. I have 7,000 that are willing to do what you've done.
be, keep the mentality of the one person, the one that's focused on the Lord, the one that is confident in what the message of the Lord has given. Don't let yourself become self-important. Don't convince yourself that you're the only one that can handle it. Because you can miss out on some of the greatest blessings. And, and the greatest blessing is that you are used by the God of the universe. The creator of the universe is using you, wants to use you, wants to talk to you, give you a message. That is one of the greatest blessings. Because even if it is, a, whether it's a message of hope, whether it's a message of judgment, there is love in it. There is the presence of the Lord in it. What can one person do? Everything. You look at Ananias. That man faced death in obedience to the Lord. And he touched one man. We don't know if Ananias did anything else for the rest of his life. He could have just gone and sat back in his house. But he touched one man. One man. And in his obedience, in touching and laying on hands of one man, he led one of the most prolific missionaries, one of the most prolific writers in the Bible, to Christ and touched millions, millions, billions probably of people who have read the word, have read his letters in ages past and now. Because Ananias was obedient and chose to stay humble and be used as one person, the world has encouragement through Paul. Did Ananias really know what Paul was going to go and, on and do? No, he didn't. I, I doubt it. You know, the only thing Ananias knew was that he was going to suffer because that's what the Lord said. He knew Paul was going to suffer. But because he was obedient, kings heard the message of salvation. You know, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you have believed as the Lord gave to each? I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. One can plant, one can water, and you may never see the fruits of either but it's about being obedient. Being obedient to be the one person that God chooses to use. What can one person do? Everything. And I don't even have to quote that through God everything is possible. You know, I don't even need to use Jesus as the one person that changed the world. Because the Bible is full of people, one person, willing to be used. No matter how sinful, no matter how broken, no matter their own thoughts of faults and flaws. You know, I'm sure each and every one of these guys had a had an in-depth conversation with the Lord. Micaiah going, really, you want me to say that to them? 
You know what's going to happen? It's not going to be a good time. But he chose to be obedient. Oded. Died for it. And probably as he was saying it and speaking those words in his head, he was probably like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. But he chose to be obedient. You know, so are we willing, are we willing to sacrifice for the God who sacrificed everything? Are you willing to sacrifice a little time, a little embarrassment, gaining more quiet time when friends leave you, to be that one person? To allow yourself to be the one person that God uses. He may use you to turn the tide of an army. Or he just may use you to touch one person. So, when you say, I can't do this, Lord, when you struggle saying, you want me to do what? The truth is, one person can do everything. In the same way, God is everything for us. He can be that one person for us when we're at a loss, when we're fighting, when we're lost, when we're lonely, when we're crying, when we're happy, when we're mad. He can be that one person. And you just have to listen. And you have to look. Because he's already said it. He's already demonstrated it. Lord, we just feel sometimes that we are less than, that we can't be used, that we are just scum on your boot. Especially on those days when we feel like we've sinned more than we could ever believe. And so we just ask that you cut us free from that line of thought. Change our hearts, soften our hearts, Lord, and strengthen our backbones as we seek you to be that one person that you talk to, that you use, Lord. And when you promise to never leave us nor forsake us, let us believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt that whether armies, hundreds, thousands, or just one stand before us, we can proclaim your truth as it needs to be proclaimed. We give all glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.